praise Him. Clap your hands. Lift your voice. Shout unto God. When the voice of triumph. I know we're in a chapel. We've got acoustic guitars. But come on. Jesus! Lord, everybody, amen, why don't we all stand together, go out in the aisle, step out, go greet somebody, welcome them to the house of the Lord on this wonderful Sunday evening service. smiling, give them a reason to smile. If you need a good joke, come see me. I'll tell you one. So we, <laughs> Amen. Now that we've welcomed each other here, I wonder if we can welcome Jesus here tonight. Amen. Are you thankful that we serve an on-time God? What a great presence of the Lord that was here this morning. Are you thankful that we can be blessed above and still broken beneath? Amen. But God covers us. What a great word that we heard here today, and now you're back tonight, and we're ready for God to minister to every one of our needs, and it doesn't matter how great or how small, spiritual, physical, emotional, whatever it is, amen, but I'll tell you what, well, how's that going to happen, Pastor? Here's what I've learned in living for God is that if I just somehow, even through all the stuff that you have to face and it is real. You've got to worry about finances. You've got to worry about health. You've got to worry about this and that and life and family and all that stuff. So we don't do away with all that. But here's what I challenge you tonight. If we can just focus on him and saying, God, I'm here for you tonight. Not for what you can do for me, but just I'm here to worship you. I'm here, Lord, just to glorify you and to magnify you. How do I do that? Even if you're tired, you still clap your hands. If you're weary, you still lift your hands. If, if you're worried about tomorrow, you let your mind just forget about all that and say, Lord, this is the day that you have made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm not going to take thought for all that, but right now I'm going to focus on you. My heart is going to be fixed on you. My mind is going to be fixed on you. And I promise you, if we'll get our hearts and minds fixed on him, the name of Jesus is going to take care of some stuff tonight. Amen. So I wonder if we could just right now lift our hands and lift our voices. Let's lift up that name that's above every name. Come on. His name is greater. It's a mighty name. It's a healing name. It's a saving name. The name of Jesus is great above all other names. Come on. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess one day at that name. Come on. Just the mention of his name, there is deliverance. There is healing. There is salvation. Whatever you have need of tonight. 
We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of worship and praise. Let's have our hearts ready for the Lord tonight.
Sunday night, can we just worship him and let him know how much we love him? Come on, do you believe that he's good? Do you believe that he's able? Do you believe that there is nothing impossible for him? If you believe, amen, God can touch and God can move. I just, uh, we're singing that song and, man, I just couldn't help but think about John chapter 7. He said, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And then he said this, 
He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen. You say, Pastor, I'm just, man, it's kind of dry. I'm going through a dry spell. It's hot outside. And you look outside and say, man, Pastor, that's just my life. It's just hot. Amen. I told somebody the other day, if this weather's done anything, it's reminded you of no other reason why you want to go to heaven. Just tell the truth, shame the devil. That's all right. But amen, I want to make heaven my home. But we've got so, so much more to go to heaven for. Somebody say amen. But he said, if you believe with on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And that sounds so good in a hot, dry place. But you know what he was talking about was something much more important than staying cool when it's 100 plus degrees outside and 90 plus percent humidity. What he was talking about was something that's great for eternity. Because he said, this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. And I want to tell you today that if it, it doesn't matter where you are in life. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you've got a promise. If you'll believe him as the Scripture has said that he will give you the Holy Ghost just like he gave those in the upper room, just like he's given those that's in this room with you tonight. Tonight is a great night to receive the Holy Ghost. It's a great night to be born again of the water and the Spirit, and that's what God's desire is for you. Amen. If you need healing in your body, I want you to be healed. If you need things in your marriage put back together, we want all that to work out. Amen. Amen. If you here tonight, you're worried about your big toe. God's worried about your big toe, too. But amidst all of that, the most important thing is to make your calling and election sure with Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to challenge you tonight. Make sure. Look at your neighbor and say, make sure. Amen. Make sure that you know you are where you're supposed to be right now with Jesus. Amen. I'm telling you, if, if we'll do that, then God's will is being done. Amen. Amen. And I, I know we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we've got several needs that are represented. Continue praying with the Lindley family. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, by the way, the visitation is Wednesday night from 5 to 9 p.m. here at the church. And the service will be Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m. And any of our men that would like to be honorary pallbearers, Sister Lindley said that it would be an honor for you all to uh, to do that. And she's got some pallbearers that will be there with the, the body and stuff. But any of our men that would be willing to be honorary pallbearers, uh, they would just be honored by that. And so uh, that would she wanted me to make that announcement so you can come see me, and I'll be sure to let her know as well. But we want to lift them up in prayer. And there are several other needs of sickness uh, that are represented on our prayer list. And I know there are other needs that's represented this morning. And you're back here tonight and you, you lifted your hand this morning. There's needs in your life. And if I ask you to lift your hand right now, you would lift your hand again. That there's needs. And I know there's deeds. Amen. But tonight as we pray, I want us to pray specifically for souls. That all right? And I believe as we do that, it's not saying that no other need is not important. It's just putting the focus right now on what we want to happen to this next little bit. Amen? And so we want souls to be saved. We want lives to be changed. Amen. We want God's Spirit to be poured out in our community, in our city. Amen. Yes, we want He. We want signs and wonders, and we want demonstration. Amen. But there's something powerful when people just surrender and say, God... Here I am. Let your will be done in me. Amen. And so I promise you, if you'll just surrender yourself to that, God's going to meet you in a great and wonderful place tonight. And I'm telling you, that's what we desire for. That's what we desire for your eternity. Amen. Amen. So we lift our hands right now. God, I love you so much. God, I thank you, Lord, for your presence that's in this place. I thank you, God, for every person that's represented, Lord, that's here, that's come on this holiday week, God, that's made effort to be in the house of God. I'm thankful for that. And Lord, I'm praying right now, God, that you would touch our minds and you would touch our hearts. God, that any wall that we've put up, Lord, that we would let those walls come down. 
Lord, during this praise and worship, Lord, as we send praise up to you and your glory comes down, let it be able to, to convict us, God. Let it be able to prepare us, Lord, for what you want to do in every one of our hearts before we leave. Don't let us leave the same people. God, let us leave changed. Let us leave challenged, oh God. God, I pray, Lord, for every individual, Lord. You know the condition of the heart. I don't, but you do. God, in your word has said that if we believe as the scripture has said, Lord, that, that there's going to be rivers of living water. You're, you're going to fill us with the Holy Ghost. That's your promise. The promise is unto to us tonight. God, I thank you for your promise. God, it doesn't matter how much we've ever gotten ourselves into, Lord, that we're so far away from you, but you're here tonight to draw us close. God, I pray, Lord, for every sinner, for every saint alike, God, that we would have a hunger to draw close to you, that we could see you, Lord, fulfill your part of the word where you will draw close to us, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.
our hands right now and just love him and worship him hallelujah expectancy in this place tonight. God, I love you, Lord. Well, now I think I'm in the midst of some believers that are here tonight, that you just believe that God is who he says he is, that he is the great almighty, that he is your savior, that it doesn't matter what you've been through, that he is able to bring you out. He is able to keep you. He is able to see you through. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That song, it goes, and it's, it's another song. It just says, here I am to worship. I know that song. Can we just lift our hands right now? I don't want to mess anybody up, but I want to challenge you. If you, maybe the Lord's been tugging on your heart during this service already. Hey, look, we've got a preacher here. And I promise you, he's not bothered by what we're doing right now. But I want to tell you, if God's been tugging on your heart in this service, I want to give you an opportunity right now. I, I just feel this in the Holy Ghost. To step out maybe from where you're standing. If you want to come around the front, hey, look, I promise you, we're not in any hurry tonight. This is holiday week. It's freedom weekend. It's a great weekend to be free. So I want to challenge you. If God's been tugging on your heart, even in this service, I want to give you this opportunity as they start singing this song. Just to step out from where you are. Obey God. This is a safe place just to be obedient to the voice of God, the pull of God, the spirit of God. So as they sing that, if we just enter into this place with expectancy and obedience to the spirit, the voice of God right now. If God's been tugging on your heart, God, you know who you are. And God's got something for you tonight. I wouldn't stay where I was standing, but I would find my way to an altar and just give it all to him. Here I am, Jesus. Here I am, Jesus. Here I am. Here I am to worship. Here I am. of you giving yourself away. He's worthy of you stepping outside of your pride. He's worthy of you surrendering everything to him. I'll never know how much it costs to 
Amen. Can we just worship him for a moment more? God, you're worthy. Here I am to say that you're my God, that you're altogether lovely, that you're altogether worthy. God, more than anything else in this world, God, I want to please you. More than anything else in this world, God, I want to be who you want me to be, God. I want to be the man of God. I want to be the husband. I want to be the father that you want me to be. Well, is that your desire on this Sunday night? God, we want your will. Not my will, but your will be done. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. Praise God. What a great God that we serve. And I know there's other things in the service order. And don't leave you because you can't have church without taking up an offering. But we're not going to do that right now. But I do want to give opportunity for the word of the Lord to go forth and to minister to us. Amen. And I'm, I like what I feel in the presence of God on this Sunday night. I appreciate the response that you are having toward the presence of God and singing and worship and all that is great. But there's salvation through the preached word. Amen. The preached word brings about conviction, challenges us in areas that we're lacking, challenges us moving forward in the places maybe we're still and maybe standing still in the places we're trying to get forward. The word of God directs us. Amen. And so I believe we've got a man of God here tonight that's heard from God that's going to share with us what the Lord's laid on his heart. And I'm so thankful for the word we heard this morning. Amen. As he's coming tonight, I want us to continually be in prayer for his wife. Amen. That God would just bring healing to her body. And we've been praying that. And I know that God is able. And we stand on that, brother. We, Amen. I'm telling you, we, we stand on it. And we pray and we believe. But I'm telling you, amen. I believe he's got a word for us tonight. And I want us to tune our ears and hearts into what the word wants to speak to us. Amen. Amen. Brother Whitman, come up. Amen, amen, amen. God is so good. Man, I love being able to hear myself. I mean, and it's not that I'm all that enamored with myself, but I just, amen. When you travel, you go most places and you can't hear yourself. Amen. And if they don't respond out there, you wonder if it's because they can't hear you either. Amen. God is intentional. What I mean by that is nothing that God does is random. Nothing that God does is whimsical or on a whim. I guess whimsical is the wrong word, but not whimsical either. Nothing that God does is without reason, without cause, without purpose. God is intentional. And so when God's doing something, it's on purpose. And when God seems to not be doing anything, it's still on purpose. That's why we can praise him. And we're good at praising him when stuff's happening. We're good at praising him when mountains are moving, when sick are getting healed, when things are happening. But we've got to be equally good at praising him when it seems that nothing is happening. Because when he's doing something, he's up to something. But when he's not doing something, he's still up to something. And if we can learn that and understand that, we can praise him when something's happening. And we can praise him when nothing's happening. Because we understand that whether it's nothing happening or something happening, he's up to something. Amen. 
Well, I'll tell you what, I'm struggling right now. Amen. I kind of feel like a cat between two brothers. Pulled that way on this. Amen. Trying to make sure and decide, but. I think I'm just going to stay in the direction that I felt all week. I just kind of felt a little bit of an inkling because I don't know who you are that's here, but I'm just going to tell you something. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if you don't have and know for a fact that God is living on the inside of you and you are ready for heaven right this very minute, you are missing out on the greatest gift that will ever happen in your life. Amen. I've said it here before. Healing is great. But if you don't get healed, you can still get to heaven. Miracles are awesome, but if you can still get to heaven without a miracle, But if you don't have the Holy Ghost, we're all in trouble because we got to have the Holy Ghost baptized in his name, not just stuck in water somewhere and somebody calls out some words over you. I mean being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Amen. Now that I've got that off my chest, I want to take your attention to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. Amen. Brother and Sister Seldon, again, thank you so very much. Amen. I'm always honored. I enjoy my time when I'm here. Amen. To this church, thank you. You have always been so kind to our ministry. Amen. You have responded, in, even this morning, amen, in responsiveness to the Word of God. Amen. Because you got to understand something. I didn't come to preach so you could say that was a good message. I didn't come to preach so you could say that, man, he, he can preach. That's, that's just not, that's not the point. I came to preach to try to make a difference in somebody's life. And when you respond to the word, that helps me to understand. And I go home feeling like, we got somewhere today. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. How with all, he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me. And more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, in our more common language, when he heard that, when he heard that, he arose and went for his life. If I was writing that in common language, when he heard that, he ran for his life. And came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It's enough. Anybody ever just sat down and said, I've had enough? Well, I didn't get a very good response there. Come on, how many of you ever just sat down and said, you know what, I've had enough. I can't take any more. Said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. For I am not better than my father. 
want to preach to you from this thought for the next little bit, and I'm going to try to preach quickly because my assignment is bigger than my time allotment. And so I need the speed of the Holy Ghost to move this with us. But I want to preach to you, I want to talk to you this evening about Jezebel's voice. Jezebel's voice. Pastor, would you again be so kind? You may be seated. Elijah comes on the scene rather suddenly. He just appears uh, as as a prophet. He he appears uh, rather almost uh, just, just out of nowhere, it would almost seem. The Bible doesn't tell us much about where he came from and what, what his background was, but the Bible does tell us that there came a point at which because of Israel's rebellion and because of Israel's uh, hard-headedness and refusal to worship God, that God took uh, the moment and so Elijah shows up. He walks into the palace of the sitting king at that time whose name was Ahab and He comes into Ahab's uh, palace, and when he walks in, he simply walks into the throne room, and with just no fanfare at all, he walks to the king's throne and says, I'm going to tell you something. Because of the way that this nation has been and because of the things that she's doing, because of the things that you as the leader are allowing, the Bible says that, He told Ahab that as of this moment, there's not going to be rain until I say it will rain. I suspect that at that moment, he probably looked mostly kind of like a a nutcase. I'm sure that Ahab, not really knowing Elijah, not having much background on Elijah, probably didn't think too much about this, probably wondered how this crackpot got into his throne room, how he managed to get before him. And and I'm sure that for a while Ahab thought very little about it. But see, what had happened was Ahab married a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel was not of the Hebrew faith. And so when she came into the nation, she brought with her prophets and her God, who was Baal. When the nation, and the way this worked was she basically spread her prophets throughout the land in order to, uh, to promote the, 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 the uh, religion of Baal, to promote Baal throughout the nation. And you see... There's some 250, 300 prophets that she has. And and this is how it basically works. You see, the theory was and, and the working process was that the more they said it, the more it would be true. The more people saying it, the more it made it true. It's the same thing we deal with today. It's not any different today. The more people who promote something, if they can get celebrities to promote something, if they can, it doesn't matter if the Bible teaches against it. It doesn't matter what Christianity is, tells about it. The idea is if enough TV shows, if enough news anchors, if enough uh, sports figures, if enough Hollywood figures will begin to promote something and push something, whatever that thing is, it may have been a lie at one point, but because they keep promoting it and pushing it, it becomes a truth for the nation at that time. 
I don't have time to sit here and explain that to you, but I, I think you understand. It doesn't take much to see how that there is such a pressure throughout our world today uh, to, to, to promote things that, that are clearly anti-biblical principles and anti-biblical things, uh, but they're pushed and they're promoted uh, until companies and, and, and corporate figures, and it becomes all of this push, this push, until what is false, what the Bible calls wrong, becomes a truth for our nation. And so it is that Jezebel's prophets have spread throughout the land and promoted this gospel of Baal, if you will, and pushed all of this out there. And because they have spent so much time getting it out there now, the nation of Israel is as likely to worship Baal as they are Jehovah. And it is for this reason that Elijah has now shown up in Ahab's palace and declared that there will be no rain. When Ahab uh, hears this uh, and does not respond, but the thing is, I suspect, because this goes on for a while, I suspect after two or three months of no rain, somebody began to say, hey, you know, you remember that guy that came in here? Somewhere along the line, it began to be such that, that he began to, to realize uh, maybe there was something to what that guy said. Somebody needs to figure out who that was. Somebody needs to go and find him. And while he turns around and walks out of Ahab's palace, having declared no rain, the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Elijah and said, Now, I want you to go over, i got a brook over here, and I want you to go and I want you to dwell there because I have prepared a place there for you. Amen. How many are glad that God prepares a place even in the middle of a problem, even in the middle of a trap? i got news for somebody. you worried about what's going on in the news. You're worried about what's going on in politics. I don't tell you that I like it, but what I will tell you is... God prepares a place for his people even in the middle of the situation, even in the middle of a problem, even when everything else is going crazy and it seems like the whole world has chosen not to serve God. He still prepares a place in the midst of punishment, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trial. He prepares a place for his people. I know he told the disciples, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I understand that we use that text and refer often to heaven about it. But I want you to understand there's an overarching principle that is much larger than just heaven. That whatever the situation is, God prepares a place for you. And so he told Elijah, I want you to go there. Everybody say there. Well, that was good if we'd have been somewhere else. Everybody say there. Thank you. And so Elijah goes to the brook. And while he's there, the Bible says that ravens begin to bring food to him. They begin to show up on a daily basis with his meal. And uh, over time, this goes on. And eventually, the Bible tells us that the brook begin to dry up. And once it dried up, the Lord again spoke to Elijah and he said, Elijah, I want you to go to the widow's house because I've prepared for you a place there. Let me tell you something. When the brook runs dry and the bird don't fly, God's still got a place prepared for you. Don't let the enemy talk you out of it. Don't let the enemy fool you. Amen. God has a place prepared for his people. He's got a safe place. He's got a place of provision, a place where everything's going to be all right, a place of blessing, a place of favor. In the middle of trouble, there's a place of blessing. In the middle of problems, there's a place of favor. God has got it. And so he goes down. He gets to the widow's house. When he gets there, he begins to ask her, would you mind to take a few minutes and make me a cake? Bring me a little water. I'm, a, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. She 
replies back to him, we don't have enough food for that. We have just enough that I was about to make a cake for myself, uh, and then I was going to sit down with my son, and we were just going to die. I don't know about you, but that's kind of a hopeless situation. And he said, if you would just be kind enough. He didn't promise her anything. He just said, would you bring me a cake? And so somewhere in her heart of obedience, she makes a cake. And she cooks it. And then I can see in my mind's eye that after she brings the cake to the prophet, she goes back and perhaps she prepares to just dump out the oil cruise and throw away the meal barrel. And about the time she tips it up, she looks in the meal barrel and there's still a little bit left down in the meal barrel. She begins to wonder about it. She scoops down. There's still enough for another cake. So then she thinks, well, now I've got meal, but I don't have enough oil. And she goes over, and sure enough, there's enough oil still in the oil, oil vessel that allowed her to make another cake. And I want you to understand something. From that moment on, because of her obedience to God, because of her obedience to what the man of God asked her, because of that obedience, she didn't have an abundance, but she always had enough. Sister Soden, we, we live in a day when people are preaching a gospel of abundance. God's going to overflow you. I'm not promising you that God's going to overflow you, but I will tell you, God will make sure there's always enough. God will make sure there's always enough to get you through the situation, enough to take care of your family, enough for whatever your need is. God will always make sure there's enough if you'll just honor him, if you'll keep him first, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God. All the rest of these things will be added to you. And so, for another period of time, he lives there. Every day the widow makes another cake for him, and then a cake for herself, and a cake for her son. The meal barrel seems empty when she gets done with that last cake that day, but the next morning when she gets up, it's there again. Somewhere along the line during all this story, the Bible says that the son died. Some of y'all wonder why I'm going through all this. You'll understand in a minute. But the Bible said that the son died. And the widow came and said, did, did, did God do this to make fun of me? Is God visiting my past sins on me? Is God bringing down judgment on me because of things that I did in my past? Uh, Elijah, upset by the whole situation, picks up the boy, takes him to his bed, his bed chamber, stretches him out on the bed. The Bible said he stretched out over him and began to pray over him. And all of a sudden, that boy that had been stone cold dead uh, raised up uh, life in him. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, he became again a living, breathing boy that he had always been. Eventually, Elijah comes to the point that he calls the nation of Israel together. And he says, we've got to make a decision. He said, if Jehovah's God, let's serve Jehovah. But if Baal's God, we'll serve Baal. We can't do this split thing, going back and forth all the time. We've got to make a decision. If it's Baal, I'll worship Baal with you. If it's Jehovah, you worship Jehovah with me. We've got to decide who's God. You know, some of us in this house need to make a decision about who's God. Is your family God or is Jehovah God? Is your job God or is Jehovah God? Well, I don't have time. I, I just don't have to preach right there, but I'll think I'll just move right on for a minute. And so he calls the nation again. He says, this is what we'll do. The God that answers by fire, he will be our God. The people agree. And, and so Elijah has so much confidence that he says, boys, you all go ahead and do your thing first. 
And so for the better part of that day, the Bible says that the prophets of Baal, they begin to build the altar. They put the sacrifice on there. They begin to cry out and chant and sing and have all their church services, and nothing happens. Oh, Elijah says, hey, maybe you need to holler a little louder. I bet your God's gone to sleep. You need to wake him up. They're screaming a little louder. They begin to cut themselves uh, to get his attention. Uh, Elijah don't let up any. He says, you boys need to holler a little louder. He must have gone on vacation or something. So finally it gets along about dinner time. And nothing's happened. And so the Bible says about the time of the evening sacrifice, he said, gentlemen, I've given you the whole day and you've gotten nothing. I need a few minutes for myself right now. And so the Bible says that he rebuilt the altar. He put the wood on the altar. He put the sacrifice on top of it. And then in a show of not arrogance but confidence, he says, bring me 12 barrels of water. And he pours out 12 barrels until in the middle of a land that has not had one drop of water, not dew, not frost, not rain, not mist, nothing, for three and a half years now. And the, the, he calls and brings 12 barrels of water, pours it over until the entire thing is saturated and it's standing with a moat full of water around it, prays a simple little 63-word prayer, and all of a sudden out of heaven, fire falls. The fire consumes the sacrifice, burns the wood, incinerates the stones, but it don't stop there. Because all my life you put fire out with water, but when God gets involved, you put water, you put you put water out with fire. I can't even talk right. It said it licked up the water until there was nothing left there. The people begin to shout, Jehovah is God. Jehovah is God. And so he grabs them. He says, all right, gather up all of those prophets. Take them over in the valley and slay them. Now, Sister Soden, I think that this is what, this is what happens to us. Because sometimes we come and we get excited about good church. And they've seen fire fall, and they've seen all of this going on, but they still don't have what they need. They're still a dry and a thirsty land. There's still no rain. There's still we come and we get all excited at church, and whoo, I feel good, and the music was great, and the preaching was exciting, and, and we go home, but we go home without what we need because we're satisfied sometimes with the experience, but not the what the, getting the thing that we need. But Elijah says, all right, we've already, now we've had all the fireworks and the great show and all that going on. You've been well entertained, but now we need rain. And the Bible said he got himself down in the, it, it, it would be the Hebrew birthing position and began to pray. But while he's praying, he sends a servant off to look over the top of the hill. I preached about that, I think, the last time I was here. We got to make sure that we don't just pray. We got to pray and we got to look for the answer. Servant goes up to the top of the hill, does it comes back, he says, What'd you see? Nothing. He said, Well, you need to go again. And he kept praying. Sent him back the second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. Still, every time the same answer. Some of us quit before we get the answer. We had a great altar service a few minutes ago. We we had a good move of God. We had a little firefall, but then that's where everybody quits. Well, that's enough. I got news for you. We didn't get everything we needed. We got a good touch. We felt good during the music, but 
We need a little something more. We need a little rain in our soul. We need a little bit of, it's dry and it's thirsty on the inside. We got some problems in our family. We got some situations in our health. We got some messes uh, going on uh, outside of these doors. uh, And we need more than just to feel good at church. Uh, We need rain. We need some people who refuse to quit until it rains. I'm not going to quit praying. I'm not going to quit fasting. I'm not going to quit showing up. I'm not going to quit at any of this. I need rain. I need rain in my health. I need rain in my family. I need rain in my finances. I need rain. And so finally... He comes back the seventh time. What did you see? Oh, I saw rain. Well, I saw a cloud. And it was just the size of a man's hand. Oh, Elijah said, that's enough right there. It's coming. Because we hadn't seen a cloud in three and a half years. And if I see a cloud, I heard a rain. The Bible says, he said, I heard the sound of an abundance of rain. It didn't matter what his eyes saw because he didn't walk by what he saw. He walked by faith. He didn't walk by how he felt. He walked by faith. Faith cometh by hearing and he had heard the sound of an abundance of rain so it didn't matter how big or how small the cloud was he had already heard the rain and he made up his mind it's coming strapped on his nikes and began to run he got himself back to the palace before the king who had left in a chariot hours before even got down there now if elijah had had a facebook page Elijah Ministries Incorporated. That night, he would have gone home and he would have posted, we had off the chain church. Fire in the morning, rain in the evening. He would have been excited because there was a powerful move of God in the morning and then all the needs were met in the evening. And that would have been the end of Sunday for Elijah. But Monday morning, Ahab sitting down at the palace Jezebel, I don't know where she'd been up to now, but she shows up. How was your weekend? Oh, it was all right. How was yours? Good. Anything happened in your weekend? You mean you didn't hear? No. And she, he began to rehearse how the, the prophets and the fire and the rain and all this stuff going on. And something went off inside of Jezebel. How many of you know there is a godly anointing? I would also submit for your consideration that there is a demonic anointing. And there came a demonic anointing that hit Jezebel. It didn't bother her that fire had fallen. That didn't get her attention. It didn't bother her that for three and a half years there was no rain and then all of a sudden an outpour began to fill up every creek, every pond. That didn't that didn't get her attention. But when Ahab said, he killed your prophets, something deep and demonic happened on the inside of Jezebel that set off something inside of her, an anger that could only be fueled by the fires of hell, if I might say it that way. An anger it could only be described as literally demonic. Some of you just, I'm, I'm telling you that because some, when I get to another point here in this message, you're going to understand. Now, I want to time out for just a quick minute. I told you this morning I grew up old church. Old church 
We used to preach about Jezebel. Jezebel was that woman that come to church wearing pants, makeup, and jewelry. That was Jezebel. I want to tell you something. That that is not who Jezebel is. Jezebel is a spirit that despises godly authority. Jezebel is a spirit that will do its best to intimidate, to manipulate, to, 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 to uh, cause confusion through intimidation. I've been in boardrooms where there wasn't one woman in the boardroom, but Jezebel was there. Kind of quiet on me there, brother. (laughs) I've seen families where fathers were Jezebels over their family. I've seen mothers operating under a spirit of Jezebel, trying to control the family, trying to control the husband, trying to control the way that God has set up. And and I'm not here to be... Uh, chauvinistic or anything like that, but God has established an author- uh, a, a, a pattern of authority for the family. And if you don't like it, you can talk it up with him because he's the one that wrote it. I'm just trying to follow it. So I need you to understand that when we're talking about Jezebel, we're talking a whole lot more than some woman that walks through the door wearing makeup and all that stuff. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a spirit of intimidation that tries its best to silence uh, the voice of God in your life. And when Jezebel hears that her prophets have been destroyed, the anger that she didn't have when fire fell, the frustration that she didn't get When the rains came. But something different happened. When she realized that her voice had been silenced. Her way of controlling things, her way of manipulating things, her her way of of taking uh, authority throughout the land had been silenced. And when that happened, something went off on the inside of Jezebel that she sent word to Elijah. You know, Elijah that called down fire. Elijah that got the rain. Sent word to him and said, so may the gods do to me. And more, if I don't do to you what you did to my prophets by this time tomorrow. Now, I want to just time out for a minute, and I want you to understand something, because this is, this, this is so key to understanding things. If I was an assassin, I wanted somebody killed, let's just put it that way, and I knew where they lived, I wouldn't send FedEx over there to drop off a package. I wouldn't send the mailman with a letter. If I knew where they lived, I'd send an assassin. She knew where Elijah was to get a message to him, but she knew she couldn't do anything about it uh, because she knew if she, if she had thought she could, she would have sent soldiers after him. The Bible says that the enemy goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Because all the lion's got is a roar. You see, here's what happens. The lion knows he can't outrun the antelope. But he hopes that if he roars loud enough, 
the antelope will forget that it's an antelope. The antelope will forget that it can run, that it can dodge. His hope is that with his roar, he can freeze the antelope and destroy him because he knows that's the only way he's going to get him. The enemy knows that he can't touch your life. He knows he got he has to have permission. The Bible says seeking whom he may needs permission to devour. He knows that. When the enemy was given permission to go to Job, I don't read anywhere where the enemy showed up and said, Hey, you know what I'm gonna do to you? I'm coming after your family and your finances and your health. Because when the enemy had permission, he didn't need to roar. All he needed to do was just go do it. But I want to submit to your thought, and I'm going back to my story a minute, that the enemy, seeking whom he may devour, will roar, hoping that you'll forget that you can pray. Hoping that you'll forget that you can fast. Hoping that you'll forget that you've got an anointing. Hoping that you'll forget... Because if he can get you to forget you're a God, a child of God, if he can get you to forget that there's an anointing in your life, if he can forget that, get you to forget that you know how to pray, you know how to speak in tongues, you know how to take authority over the enemy, you know how to cast out devil. If he can get you to forget that, then he can destroy your life, destroy your family, destroy your finances. If he can roar loud enough to get you to forget. So Jezebel roars. Brother Soden, I would have thought that when Jezebel sent the message to Elijah, Elijah would have stood up Pulled his robe up a little bit, tucked everything in and said, listen here, Jesse. I stopped the rain just with my voice. You go ahead and send your best efforts. I'd like to think, Sister Soden, that Elijah would have said, you know what? I sat by a, I sat by a brook and ravens brought me food. I'd like to think that he would have said, you know what? I spoke over a meal barrel and a cruise of oil, and it lasted a widow and her son and me for the rest of this, this whole famine. I want to think that Elijah would have said, hey, Jezebel, let me tell you about the time I raised the dead. Or at least, Jezebel, I called down fire. I prayed and God answered with fire. I spoke and God caused rain to start after three and a half years of no rain. I would like to think all of that. But what happened uh, in measure was uh, the Bible says that when she sent word to him, uh, when he heard it, it scared him so bad that he picked up what he had around him and took off running as fast as he could go. Why are you preaching about this preacher? Because the Bible says that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. So if it could happen to Elijah, it can happen to us. I'm afraid I'm messing this thing up because I'm trying to go so fast and yet get my my thought together. But... There is a voice of Jezebel. And if you've ever heard it, it's not like all the other voices. Sometimes it comes from a doctor's report. Sometimes it comes from the county sheriff. Sometimes it comes from 
the bank. But there is an underlying demonic anointing on that voice that's not like all the other voices that you hear. We all hear voices. We all have doubts. We all, we all, but there are moments when there is a demonic anointing that speaks a threat over your life, over your health, over your family, over your, your, your finances, over the situations that's going on in your life. And there's something that's different about it. And when Jezebel spoke, it struck fear so deep into the heart of the man that it raised the dead, called down fire, brought rain, seen the ravens. It struck, it's so deep that the Bible says he grabbed what he had and took off running. He ran until he was completely exhausted, laid down, went to sleep. The Bible says an angel woke him up, fed him. He went back to sleep. After a little bit, the angel woke him up again and fed him a second time. And the Bible says it gave him strength. Now, I understand some of you just looking at me like I, like you don't have a clue what in the world I'm talking about, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You don't hear it every day, but every now and then you, you've heard that voice speak up, and when it spoke, it just drove a fear deep on the inside of you. And here's what happens. I'm going to say this. I'm going to try to say this. But if I could make it in our language, Elijah went to church twice. He went to church that morning. He got up. Angel visited him and fed him. Went home, took a nap. Come back that night. Angel fed him again. Now you would think that that would have changed everything. You would think that a good church service would have made the difference. You would have thought that an evangelist showing up and preaching about it. You would have thought that a healing service. You would have thought that an incredible worship service like we had this morning and again this evening. You would have thought that that would have fixed the problem. But if you'll take a look at Elijah, the angel feeds him. He takes a nap. The angel feeds him again. He gets up and takes off running the wrong direction. So in spite of good church, he's still running from the voice. He finally gets to a cave. And when he gets to the cave, he's hiding there in the cave. And the Bible says that God shows up. Now watch this because this is kind of the point of the whole thing. God doesn't reprimand him. God doesn't get mad at him. God doesn't chew him out. But God asks him a question. What are you doing here? Now, some of you preachers connected that one. Because he had already assigned Elijah to be there. But because Elijah heard the voice of Jezebel, he left there. There was a place of blessing. There was a place of favor. There was a place of provision. There was everything that he needed to to get through the situations he was dealing with. But now, because he's heard the voice of Jezebel, he picks it up and he goes running. And when he finally gets far enough to stop, God says, What are you doing here? I would submit to your thinking this evening that when the voice of Jezebel speaks, its real purpose is to drive you out of there. 
to get you to leave the place of provision, to lift you to leave the place of protection, to get you to leave the place that God put you, to get you to leave and move away from where God said, I'll provide for you, I'll take care of you, I'll protect you. The place where blessing was, the place where favor was. The Bible says that he told Elijah, I want you to come out here and stand at the mouth of the cave. And he stands there. And the Bible said, all of a sudden, there came a great wind. But God wasn't in the wind. And then there came a shaking. Mountain just begins to tremble and shake them, if you will, a mighty earthquake, the whole mountain moving. But God was not in the earthquake. Then comes fire, heat burning. And the Bible again says, but God was not in the fire. We like church where the fire falls. We like church where chains get broken and things get shook and wind blowing. And oh, we, we like the mighty move of God in a church service. But watch this. When it came to the voice of Jezebel, he's still standing there afraid. He's still standing there completely out of sorts. But finally, the Bible says, then came a still, small voice. And what the earthquake couldn't do, the still, small voice could do. What the fire falling couldn't do, the still, small voice did. What the, what, 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 what the, the uh, wind blowing couldn't do, the still, small voice. I submit to you in this house today that beyond great church services, we need to hear the still, small voice. The only cure for Jezebel's voice is to hear the still, small voice of God. The only thing uh, that will overcome the fear of it, the only thing that will overcome the, 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 the prison that it would try to put you in, the only thing that will cause you to find yourself back in a place of power and authority and where God has called you to be is to hear a still, small voice of God. I'll preach all day long about somebody else. I don't like to preach about myself. And I'm not telling you this to get any personal glory. But I've heard that voice speak. I was driving through Poplar Bluff, Missouri. I stopped at a stop sign. I, I, we, at, at the time when this happened, we owned a small we own a uh, in-home care company where, that, uh, that that provided homemakers and caregivers for senior and disabled adults. And and I, I, I was sitting there at the stoplight, and I looked over at the uh, – there, there's government housing over here, and, and I'm not slamming anything, so don't anybody take it that way. And uh, – and I looked over, I just glanced over, not really thinking much about it. Just, I've been in that building a hundred times. I had clients in that building. Uh, I, I, I've gone through, every, knocked every door in that building multiple times, just trying to get new business. And, and uh, I, So I just happened to glance over at the building. And right when I glanced over, not an inaudible voice, but it might as well have been, a voice spoke up and said, when I get done with you, I'm going to leave you alone, broke, and living in one of those. And I'm not demeaning anybody that lives in it. That's not my point by any stretch of the imagination. Now, I would like to tell you 
that the evangelist, when he heard that, said, Devil, you go right ahead and give it your best shot. I've seen blinded eyes open. You go ahead. I've seen full knee replacements happen. I've seen adults that couldn't have babies get babies. You go right ahead. You, I, w- I would like to, to begin to announce off all the things that I've seen happen. I've seen God do. I, and, and when our ministry and the things that God, I've seen cancers disappear overnight when we prayed over them. I've seen all these things. I would like to tell you, Sister Soda, that I begin to go down the list of what God has done through our ministry and, and how God has allowed me to be a part of all these different miracles and healings and blessings that's going on. But Jezebel's voice is different. Brother Wallace, it did something on the inside of me that I can't explain, but something shifted on the inside of me. Some of you have heard that when the doctor came back with a report. But something just shifted. For the next year and a half, I literally thought I was going to lose my mind. Fear gripped a hold of me so hard. Quiet on me now, Sister Soda. Go back and preach about Mephibosheth. We can shout on that one. A fear gripped my heart so hard that I literally began to believe it was going to happen. I found myself in a place that by, before it was all over, for a year and a half I dealt with this thing. And before it was all over, I honestly believed that God had rejected me and I was done. Mind you, this is not when I was a teenager. This was just a few years ago while I'm an evangelist running around the nation laying hands on the sick and seeing healings and deliverances and all this stuff going on. And while I'm doing all of this, I can't tell you how many services I sat uh, right here praying, God, Lord, if you would just cause the, just move and I don't have to preach, God, just go ahead, pour out your spirit, God, let, let the preacher get anointed, God, let the, music, let, let the singers get anointed, God, and I would beg and pray and just hope that, and, and, and then I'd have to get up there and I'd preach and then we'd call and we'd heal the sick and, 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 and all that stuff going on. Have a great church service, and I'd get out of that church service after laying hands on a sick, seeing cancers banished, seeing blinded eyes opened up three different times. I'd get out of that service, go get in my car to drive home, and I'm dealing with the fear. I would walk in my basement from one end to the other end of the basement. I would just walk, and I was quoting scriptures. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I, don't, I, don't, I might not get to come back because I'm way too honest in this. But I didn't even believe that the Scriptures were true for me. I believed that I'd gotten somehow to a place. My past got drug up. Situations got brought out. And I got myself in a place where Jezebel's one little statement. And I get done with you. And for a year and a half, I'm walking in the basement. And the only reason I'm quoting scriptures is because I know that if this doesn't work, I'm going to lose my mind. Keep quoting scriptures and nothing happens. You keep going. Just keep trying. One day, after about a year and a half, I'm walking through my basement, quoting scriptures. And I heard a still, small voice. Now, what I'm going to tell you probably don't mean diddly to you. Because This isn't the still small voice for you. 
But all of the fear, all the turmoil, all the heartache, everything that I was going through stopped in a second. When God said, your problem is you've forgotten that I'm your source, not a resource. In other words, I was depending on my resources and not my source. And I realize that don't mean that much to anybody in this house. I get that. But when God spoke that voice to me, instantly, it was gone. Pastor, I don't even know why I'm preaching this, but something, I don't know. I still feel it pretty strong. Now, here's the thing, Sister Sylvia. Because after that, everything got back. I mean, I got, everything went back to normal. Church services weren't any different. Still healing the sick. Still seeing blind eyes open. Still cancer's going away. Still all that happening. Everything going on. I mean, we're still having good church and everything else. But now there's a difference because now when I walk in there, I don't mind putting my brokenness up under that table. But when we went to Mayo Clinic and the doctor said, your wife has multiple system atrophy. It's an extremely rare disease. And they began to explain to us, the best way to explain it is if you take ALS and MS, put them together, and then throw Parkinson's on top. That's what she has. And then my wife began, they told us, they said, there's no, there's no medical cure for it. We give her five to seven years. And all of this is going on. I got up and I walked out and I said, not today, devil. Not today. And then when her health progressed to the point where she is now, so that I had to cut out all my revivals, I had to quit. I, I could only travel on Sundays, and I could only move, I, I could only go out Sunday morning early and get back Sunday night late, and and, and it cut down. And, and all of a sudden, uh, our income got cut to almost nowhere. The devil came back. Jezebel curled herself right up on my shoulder and said, Do you remember what I told you? But I said, It is not true. You can't do this. And I began to learn how to say, I don't know about tomorrow, but not today. I don't know about what the future holds, but I know it's not today. So in July, I don't know what song you just played for this one. And I realize we're not going to probably end up with a great altar service, but somebody's going to walk out of here with the tools they need to fix the problem that you've been fighting for years. If I can tell you this, I do know what my assignment has been. My assignment today has been to silence the voice of Jezebel in somebody's life. <laughs> July of last year, my wife is in the hospital. 21 days. She can't speak. She can barely move, so I've got to be with her every minute. I've got to advocate for her. I've got to take care of it because doctors and nurses, they're not, you know, in the hospital. They're overwhelmed. They're, they're, not going to, they're not going to take care of her. And she needs to be taken care of. And so I have to spend 21 days in the hospital. It's 21 days of eating and living in the hospital. Six weeks that I had to come off the road to take care of her. 
only had Sundays and had to cancel all those. So now, I've got no income and elevated expenses. And it's almost the end of July, and I'm looking, I'm sitting in the hospital room, and I'm thumbing through Facebook, and I noticed that a friend, one of the young men that we had raised up in our church, who's now pastoring a home missions work in St. Louis area, was on there, and he was talking about, that they'd gotten a new building. It was a storefront, and they needed money and offerings to help them because they were trying to, to get it turned around. And the Holy Ghost speaks to me and says, send him $2,500. I said, you send him $2,500. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. I've been unemployed for six weeks and living in a hospital. Holy Ghost said, send him $2,500. And so I wrote the check out on July 31st, and I mailed it to him. Brother Wallace, on August 31st, one month to the day later, I sat down and pulled out our ministry books and began to look through it. And in those 31 days, in addition to all of the regular money that comes in, we have a number of people that support us and, and things and, 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 and help us. And in addition to the, all of the, the money that, 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 that comes in, God sent us $25,000 extra. The reason I'm telling you that is, is because God prepared a there for me. Send $2,500. That was my there. But if I had still been running from the voice of Jezebel, I can promise you that in my fear and in my intimidation and everything that was going on on the inside of me, I would not have sent that money. I would have left my there. I would have run somewhere else. And when I got over to wherever that somewhere else was, God would have asked me, what are you doing here? But because... The voice of Jezebel was silenced in my life because I heard that still, small voice. I was willing to live in a place of obedience, and God was able to turn around and take care of all the bills that I acquired in the six weeks and couldn't handle and didn't know what to do with. God took care of every one of them, provided all that I needed, and I've come in the house to tell somebody, if you will begin to get to where you hear the still small voice and get yourself back to the there that God has provided for you, the place of provision, the place of favor, the place where God is protecting you. I've come to tell somebody, Jezebel's trying to get you out of your place. Jezebel may whisper when you just you get that pain in your side. And Jezebel says, you know about your daddy. You know what happened to him. I could go through, but the thing is, every person in this house, if you're sitting here looking at me with a blank stare, I, I know I'm not preaching to you, and I'm not being rude. I apologize for, for, for wasting your evening. But I see some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've heard that voice. And if you're really gut level honest today, I'm going to tell you something. You've been running from that. You've been coming to church. You've been enjoying having a good church. But you're still, you go home and you're still running from that voice. 
you shout, run the aisles, get all said and done, and when you go home, you're still afraid of whatever it is that Jezebel told you. But I came to tell somebody in this house, musicians, as you come, hey, man, I'm sorry, I know this is not an easy easy service to find a, a, a song for, but I came in this house to tell somebody, I'm challenging you to make up your mind right here and right now. I've got to hear the still small voice. I'm going to fast till I hear. I'm going to pray till I hear. I'm going to quote the scriptures till I hear. I'm not going to quit until I hear the still small voice. It might not come today. It might not come tonight. But I got news for you. I do hear God uh, stepping into this room saying, uh, it's time for you to come out of the cave. Uh, It's time to quit hiding. Uh, It's time to quit being in fear. It's time to quit worrying about it. I hear the voice of God. Uh, inviting somebody come out of your cave uh, come out of where you're hiding uh, come out of the place where you think you're protected come out uh, this is not where I called you to be I didn't call you to be in a cave uh, I didn't call you to be in fear uh, I didn't call you to be in worry I didn't call you to be stressed out come out of the cave I wonder, I've delivered my heart and I have delivered transparency before you. The reason that I did that is not because I enjoy being that vulnerable. But I hope that if the preacher is willing to stand here and bear his vulnerability before you and tell you about his experience with Jezebel's voice. That maybe you'd be just honest enough to say, I've been running from that voice. It's not that I'm not saved. It's not that I'm backslid. It's not. It's just that my entire walk with God is controlled by that voice. Everything that happens in my in my believer's walk, in my, my spiritual life, everything is intimidated by that voice. And this morning or evening. I'm opening the front of this house for men, women, young people who in a moment of transparency and vulnerability will open yourself up not to the preacher, not to the pastor, but to God. And just be honest enough to say, God, I've been intimidated by that voice and I'm tired of it. I've been intimidated by that voice. I've been, I've been running. I've been trying to keep away from it. I've been, it's controlling everything in my life. It don't matter how good the church service is. It's overshadowed by that voice. I know we don't preach like this very often. Once we get my wife here, you can bring me back and I'll preach right away. tried to shift off of this message earlier. But this has been my assignment tonight. I know we're not shouting. I know we're not running the aisles. I know we're not having faith healing service right now. But I'm telling you something. If you can get healed of this, I wonder if there's anybody be honest enough to step out of your cave right now. Come on, this preacher already told you. It's not about whether or not you're prayed up. It's not about whether or not you're spiritual. It's not about whether or not you... It has nothing to do with that. It's that Jezebel has uttered a voice and it lodged a place in your spirit. 
God, in your name. God, I've come in this room to do one thing. God, I want to silence that voice in somebody's life. God, I'm tired of her tongue. I'm tired of her intimidation. I'm tired, God, of of hearing her. I'm tired of my life being run by the fear of it, God. Every time I turn around, God, I'm I'm running from it. It's chasing me. But I hear you saying, come up out of the cave. Come up out of the cave. I didn't call you to hide in a cave. I didn't call you to be intimidated. I didn't call you to live stressed out. I didn't call you to be fearful. I I didn't call you to do that. I called you to a place where I could provide for you. A a place where I would give you what you needed. A a place where I would be your shepherd. A a place where I would be your protector. a, A place where I would be your heavenly father. Come on, somebody talk to him right now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.